Welcome back, everyone. Almost a year ago, Sui Nataraja of SCI had approached me after one of our conferences to discuss the importance and upcoming impacts of logistics and supply chain with regards to rural broadband projects. I've spent time since then discussing this with the SCI team, all the while watching as the global supply chain crisis has been unfolding and even starting to affect some of the rural and remote projects I'm working on and some of my colleagues are working on. So it's with great pleasure to introduce Peter Collier to deliver his keynote on supply chain and crisis. Peter, if I could ask you to come on. Yep. Peter is the Vice President of Technology Project, a project sorry, technology, it's been a long day. Peter's the Vice President of Technology Products and Solutions at SCI. He has the responsibility for the development of the strategic plan and customer engagement model for SCI's technology clients. In addition to the strategic elements of companies plan, Peter is also responsible for business development and customer retention. Peter joined SCI in 2011, and over the course of his career at SCI, he's been involved in multiple large solution designs and implementations, client management, product development, and project management regarding acquisition and integration. Prior to joining the company, Peter held progressively senior positions at Nortel in Canada and the UK, and is also a certified Six Sigma black belt. Prior to Nortel, he worked with Revenue Canada and Customs in their EDI development and testing group that deployed national programs. So before Peter starts, I just want to mention that following his keynote, Jody Bloomer Kaput will lead a panel that includes Tim Emoff, Jerry Senderlin, and Peter that will take a deeper dive into how the supply chain crisis and Canada's collective broadband funding will impact rural and remote projects over the coming years. So Peter, thanks again for doing this and I'm really looking forward to your keynote and uh, rejoining you shortly. Okay, thanks uh, Amadeo, I really appreciate the intro. And also I think um, what's uh, interesting is that you've been able to keep this alive and going through the uh, sessions that were through the last year and a half that we've gone and, and kept this important discussion going. So great to hear that. Um, so with that, I thought maybe just to start on the, um, a bit of a humorous note because it's a serious topic. Uh, this little cartoon I, I pulled up the other day that says, uh, don't tell them the dog ate your homework, just blame it on supply chain issues. And uh, I found that humorous in a number of ways because for those of us who work in, in logistics and supply chain, we all realize that every day um, we're constantly dealing with those issues and that our job is to address them. It's not as simple as just saying, oh, there's a supply chain issue, we can't do it. It's gotta be, some sort of an evolution or discussion around that that takes it to the next level. And that's why I like forums like this, where we can dive into some of those things and even classifying the items that, uh, that come up so that we know certain ones have to be addressed every day immediately. Other ones are, are longer term, others have significant global impacts that we'll talk about uh, in a broader sense as well. But the interesting one again here is that even uh, with everything we've seen in the last two years, it shows how big the crisis is that even two students uh, fictitiously here walking along the street are going to blame supply chain issues and on their reason for not getting whatever their schoolwork was that needed to be done. And uh, if only it were that easy for the rest of us to, to pass the buck, as, if it were. Um, the next slide I wanted to put up is, uh, you know, we talk about a supply chain crisis, but really it becomes which crisis within the supply chain. And so... Um, you know, I've listed a bunch of the ones that we're starting to see across the bottom. There's many more within that, but I think uh, even getting our minds around the fact of how big and how many and the types of supply chain problems that there are uh, is important. But also, I think even just understanding the word crisis. So I went and uh, used the Oxford Dictionary description, and really it's a time of danger, difficulty, or doubt when problems need to be solved and important decisions made. And the, the, the good part about that is the solved and important decisions that need to be made I think that you can really classify and structure your businesses in such a way that the initial levels of questions and uh, solving those decisions can in many ways be compartmentalized and strategized that the smaller issues get dealt with operationally by having a very rigorous process. The larger ones need more structure, or, or sorry, less structure, but just have kind of a framework that you can adopt and apply to whatever that, that larger crisis is. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. But I think it's important to keep in mind the variety of uh, problems that we see here and, and how we label and, and progress those. So I was going to show that on the next slide. 
what I have here is just levels of crisis. You can see at the bottom, it's kind of the red, red ones that are big and, and really probably draw more of the leadership of companies' attentions of how do they address and work on, and then kind of fading down to yellow. And uh, I know Jerry, who's going to join us on the um, uh, group discussion in a moment, he, he's got a level that takes it through five levels. Uh, and, and I think one of the levels is actually smooth operations or all is quiet, which uh, I, I always like because in supply chain, all is quiet only lasts for a very short period of time. But I thought the first one is, you know, the day to day localized problems. And, and you know, I put equipment issues, scheduling, weather events. And while these aren't really crises in the same level in our minds, if we think back to the definition of what we just looked at, those, those need to be addressed and managed so they don't turn into something bigger. And really, they become bigger for the people who are directly involved and in living with them every day. So if you're waiting for an installation to take place, you need a particular piece of equipment uh, to be on site and you know trucks break down, scheduling doesn't take place, so airlines miss getting product to where it needs to get to or different trucks miss... Uh, making the right switches at night, then that, that turns into a bigger problem because the technician that was scheduled to do that job in one city now potentially can't move to another one to do the next one, snowball effect. So you have to have a lot of structure and plans around addressing those. And these are the ones that I think you can be much more descriptive in, in the sense of what you do with uh, handling those in the sense of preventive maintenance on vehicles, preventive maintenance on equipment. And when equipment breaks down, you're not trying to find a supplier that can fix it. You already have suppliers identified who can be engaged and, and take that forward. The next one uh, I think is what I, I've broadened out a little bit to multi-day, multi-site, and we have a bit of an expected end date. And when we look at those, these tend to be more things maybe similar to what we're seeing right now in, in British Columbia, in Newfoundland, um, other parts of uh, Canada go through them at any one time. Uh, a few of you may remember that about three or four years ago, the uh, Trans Canada in Northern Ontario on a bridge, suddenly the, the land shifted and there's like a two foot gap. So all Trans Canada traffic in Northern Ontario stopped dead uh, and, and, and couldn't move for a number of days. But at least it was engineers came on site, they figured out how to adjust the the land, I guess, leading up to the bridge, re repave it, you know, it's going to come to an end, but it did take multiple days. There's uh, backlogs. There's obviously time sensitive material on there, whether it's uh, medical food or, or even really technology goods that need to be at the right spot at the right time for the uh, support that they go into it. And then the bottom one is really the bigger you know, global ones that we've talked about. And this is the one that probably has caught more people's attention and made people think about the supply chain much broader than uh, uh, they have in the past. And this comes back to that opening slide where we've even got students that, that are now aware and thinking about supply chain and uh, the issues around it. And this one obviously becomes much more strategic. And I think what we've found from a leadership team and, and the discussions I've had with some of our key customers has been much more about having a framework of decision making and then applying it to whatever the problems are because there's obviously things that are happening now that never happened before uh, or if they did they happen with a different product or maybe not as uh, globally impacting to every country it was in certain areas of the world and so what we've found is in this level you really need to have a structure where you set some maybe guiding principles is what the the term we've used so keep employees safe uh, support customer engagement, plan with the customers for what they do know or what they do have, know that there's going to be variances, have a structure that says these groups will have touch points every day. We have a pandemic or emergency response team that, that was uh, addressing these with executive updates every day. Then we adjusted those to bi-weekly or not bi-weekly, uh, twice a week and then you know weekly as need be. So this is the one where you can't define a, a quick answer the way you can for the top level ones that occur and, and are part of what we see and experience, but it's an opportunity for everybody to at least put some principles down so everybody in the company can have a structure and a checklist that they can look at to say, this is the right thing to do um, in this particular situation based on whatever information is available now. And we know that behind the scenes, there's a lot of other, uh, maybe there's political activity, you know, in the US, they've had uh, some of the ports switch over to be 724 based on some um, 
advice and direction from the federal government. Um, on chip shortages, we've seen people make decisions about what types of products that are going to continue to get the chips, maybe using different chips, maybe holding certain products back depending on the timing of the year and where they are. Um, and obviously companies making adjustments to, to the type of designs that they include. All of these are longer term and there's no immediate end that we can see to, to when that's coming to, to uh, a close. And I also think COVID, I mean, that, that's the uh, elephant in the room. And I think we all know that it, every, every day we turn on the news and there's more and more information coming out. And there's pieces of that that we have to adjust to, whether it's regulations that our um, employees have to uh, submit and provide information about their status, where they're going, where they've been uh, to different organizations based on what requirements we have for them and the, and the type of role that they have. So again, many things keep evolving there and just having a broad set of guidelines for those lower level ones versus the more detailed descriptive ones at the top level makes a big difference for, for managing our way through these types of crisis. The other thing I wanted to do was actually call out some of the specific ones that we're seeing in Canada. And obviously I'm very targeted around the physical logistics movement based on uh, uh, what SCI does and where we focus ourselves. But really, you know, I've listed out here six of the key items that we see every day uh, that we need to address in, in the current market and who knows what will evolve next. But a big one right now is commercial real estate. Uh, really across Canada, many of the major cities have less than 1% available and less than 2.4% of spaces available, which is extremely tight. It's tighter than almost anywhere in the world and certainly some of the other um, previous times, histories. So what do we do with that? We, we can try to build new buildings, but they're not bring, able to bring on those buildings fast enough. Um, we can also, uh, you know, hold back inventory, try to restructure, but so there's a number of actions around there. But the other element of this is how do you get more efficient? So today, you, everybody's probably familiar with looking in a warehouse and seeing racking and standard shelving. Maybe this is one of those times now where it justifies the investment in some of the automated, which is very condensed little robots that move around inside the uh, a specific grid and frame, and they can actually pull out product and they don't need to have the regular uh, amount of space that humans would need. So again, adjust, take time, to, to get it in there, but it'll make a difference. Reduced availability of uh, labor and, and the pressure on wages. This is another one where you start looking at how do you segregate the roles people have? So you get more targeted specialists that do the uh, specialty tasks that they're trained on versus the more general labor tasks that can be done by people with uh, a different skill set or less of a skill set. So you can Maybe in the past, you'd have one person who is a generalist who could do a wide range of things, but now you can't afford to uh, pay that higher wage and have, have them doing tasks that are uh, not as specialized as what we need them to do now. So we're having to look again at how we classify the work, which resources we have, and making sure we're applying them, changing the way we do recruiting on the type of uh, labor that we'll look at, how you uh, um, analyze them as they come on board to make sure that they've got the skills they talk about. The other one, number three here is increased tracking and monitoring requirements. And while I think we've always had some level of uh, requirements to know, in our case, truck drivers have the right type of licenses, they've got the certifications they need, they maybe even have health and safety training, et cetera. We're seeing now that we're being asked by governments to pre-report who's going to drive into which locations, how long they're going to be there, the exact addresses they're going to stop at. So again, we've had to adopt, HRs had to get involved to have a, a documentation of it. There's privacy elements about saying where people are going to go, where they're not going to be. Um, and then tracking that they actually leave on time and, and meeting some of those government uh, requirements around that. And this is a very short term response time because if you want to keep freight and you need to keep uh, trucks moving, you can't wait months to build that program. That has to be turned on right away. The, the limited component availability, and I'll speak to this more from the logistics side. I know we've gotten a number of experts from um, the actual manufacturing side, but what we're seeing with that is we're getting a lot more dynamic requests. So shipments that were headed to, you know, central BC, headed to Northern Quebec, they're saying, well, no, we've only got so many available. Now we're gonna send that to New Brunswick. We're gonna put those ones in uh, Manitoba. So we see a lot of the limited component availability is increasing the need for flexibility and the speed to adjust and have a more agile supply chain. So shipping something off and expecting it to get there in two or three weeks or uh, two or three days, 
you still have to be able to adjust it no matter what the timeline is and try to re redirect where that's going to go because of the shortages. People are much more focused on trying to get the maximum return for whatever product and environment they have. The other one is competitive shipping environment. So interestingly with this topic being around e-com uh, or being around uh, broadband and, and rural and expanding out the capabilities there, one thing we've all seen is a huge growth in the e-commerce uh, because of the number of people that are, you know, shopping online for a variety of different reasons, but just uh, for, for whatever their reason is, that's made the whole network so much more tighter from ships to containers to trucks. The people I mentioned above, the availability of commercial space, every time, you know, a billion dollars worth of uh, e-commerce grows, that takes up another million square feet, say, of uh, square feet of um, real estate space. So again, we're seeing a lot of changes in that environment just due to volume as well as the network congestion that was already underway. And then I had the damaged infrastructure and, and this picture in particular I chose on purpose because if you really look at it, I mean, besides the fact that the two bridges are both uh, pretty much destroyed at either ends, uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see the river has actually wiped out half of the one side of the highway and the quarter of the other piece of the highway. So this isn't the type of thing that you quickly you know, can go in and repave and, and rebuild. A, it's bridges, so they're they're a little more complex to uh, build and make sure they're engineered properly. Secondly, you've got a river that needs to be redirected. Then you have to fill it in, and you can see that's uh, quite a distance from the the riverbed up to the to where the road was previously going by. And this is a major highway in British Columbia that's linking. You think about all of the products that are coming in on the east coast or west coast and coming across to the west would have gone along. Uh, this particular road. Now they've been diverted to back roads and, and items around there. So lots of little actions and items and what we're seeing in Canada. I'll just very quickly, because I know we're getting uh, a little tight on time here, go over a couple of things. So as I said earlier, on the first highest level uh, impacts, make sure you've got some scenarios already built. Make sure you've gone through those with your partners. Make sure you have um, plans in place that everybody knows how to execute quickly and get those off the table. I think for the other ones is look at the level of risk for a particular crisis and then determine your actions around that. Um, leverage local knowledge. And, and the one item I'll really highlight there is that there's a lot of information and I talked about that highway a moment ago about which highways and which roads you can use if there's times of year when certain uh, elements are unavailable um, to you. Those, while you can you can try to read about them on, online and whatnot, if you can really find people who've operated in these environments, that'll, that'll make a great outcome for you um, in responding to that. And then the last one is just know the environment that you're going to be operating in. So obviously rural and remote broadband, we're going to be into a lot of different locations. Uh, and again, this ties somewhat to the local knowledge, but I think there's operating expectations, whether it's hours of service you can operate, certain companies that are eligible to work in areas, and also if there's uh, elements around um, certain restrictions on types of companies and types of things that they're allowed to do at times. So I think a lot of people here are used to the regulatory elements of maybe the telecom industry, but those same elements often will flow over into the uh, supply chain and logistics pieces around that. So anyways, that's hopefully a bit of a broad-based coverage of a lot of the logistics and supply chain components that, um, that we're seeing that have been a crisis for, for the last little while, and I'm sure they'll continue, and we've got some uh, good actions for everybody to be able to chase those down. Um, and thanks, uh, Peter. And you know what? It, it's fantastic the way you were able to lead this off and give us sort of the, that overall perspective, um, and, and it's a great lead-in to the, the panel as you mentioned, because we can dive deeper in with subject matter experts talking about how this is going to impact rural and remote broadband uh, and, and you know, uh, speak to sort of the attendees. But I, I you know, that cartoon, uh, it did make me laugh because I was in a meeting and somebody was, as an excuse, said, oh, it's a supply chain crisis. And we were like, oh, come on. <laughs> no, you're just late. But in fact, um, <clears throat> it was legitimate. So I, that made me laugh. Yeah, it, it, for sure. That's good. That's the purpose. It's great. Well, thanks again, and again, thanks for uh, for 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 your uh, your team's support in this. 